Hey guys, we're about to start a big new science unit all about salt and water. And the thing about salt and water is we think of them as common everyday things that we use all the time and we take them kind of for granted. You might think that salt looks like this or some of you might have seen salt that looks like this. But did you know that salt can look a lot of different kinds of ways? Right? Look at all the different grains and textures in there. You might think that those all look like different kinds of things. If they were rocks, you would think that's different kinds of rocks. Um, but when you zoom way in, all the way to what makes up each of these different kinds of salt, they all look the same. You want to see? All right, this is salt on the molecular level. Now, you may not have heard that word before, molecule, or maybe you have and it kind of means something, maybe something like really small, and that's a good working definition for now. All of these different circles, these spheres, the green and the gray, represent the very smallest unit of what makes up everything that we see, and we call those atoms and molecules. And so right here we have salt, and what do you notice about the shape that we see? Notice it's not a round ball shape, it's a cube shape. And that makes sense because when I look at it, it looks like a cube, not round. Even the different varieties here have kind of a jagged edge to them. They're not smooth and rounded. But this is supposed to be really small. How come that and that look the same? Well, when I have all these different tiny units, they stack on top of each other like cubes on a tower, in, out, and sideways until the shape of the larger thing mimics the shape of each individual tiny thing. And why is some of it green and some of it gray? Well, we have studied as scientists all those individual mini spheres that you see, we're going to call atoms, <laughs> um, and we've given them names because they're all a little bit different. Um, and the green, the big fat green spheres are called chlorine and the tiny gray spheres are called sodium. So when I combine them together, you might see that right here that little gray has an NA and the green has a CL. Um, that's like a short code, that's like an abbreviation that scientists use for those two names. And so if you want to get really fancy, the way that scientists might refer to salt is NaCl or sodium chloride. All right, let's go ahead and talk about why salt is such a big deal. Why is it important? If you want food right now, you're probably heading over to your glorious refrigerator and it keeps everything fresh and crisp and you can have pretty much any kind of food you want anytime you want and it's wonderful. But we didn't always have refrigerators and before we did salt was one of the main ways we could preserve food. Did you know you can actually use salt to preserve fruit? Like this is lemons being put into a jar of salt. Um, this is also lemons like kind of cut in fourths and then sprinkled with salt. Um, and then you can even preserve meat. This is uh, fish being salted to, being, to be preserved. And this allowed people to take food um, all the way across the country and transport it while it was still fresh and eatable on the other side. And we take that for granted nowadays because we have Amazon Prime and we have trucks that ship things to us. But imagine the time of horseback travel um, when you had salt preserved food on the back of a carriage. If they didn't reach their destination quickly and they didn't have a refrigerator, can you imagine how smelly that fish would get by the time it crossed, say, Europe? So this allowed for different countries to trade together to say, oh gosh, we can't grow that kind of food in our country, but we would love to trade with you if you can bring it over here and make sure it's still fresh and good by the time it gets to us. And salt became so important, in fact, that many different countries used it as currency. They used it for their money. So instead of laying out a dollar bill or a debit credit card on the counter when they went to go buy things, they would lay out a bar of salt 
So this is an actual photo of um, Ethiopian salt bars. And you can see they're, they're fairly big, they're thick, right? Kind of like what I imagine like a gold bar looks like. I've never seen a gold bar, but <laughs> we can imagine. And you'll notice that it's kind of wrapped in this kind of muslin cloth here. And I imagine that's just to kind of keep it fresh. You know, you don't really want to buy this or trade the salt that everyone's touched with their grummy hands, right? And it's also helping you to carry it and everything. Um, but people, I mean, this was, this was gold. I say it's like gold. This was gold. And uh, even the Bible recognizes the importance of salt. This is 2 Chronicles 13, 5. Don't you know that the Lord, the God of Israel, has given the kingship of Israel to David and his descendants forever by a covenant of salt? Now, this is way out of context. You might be like, what is going on with this scripture? Um, but the gist of it is that the king at the time, King Abijah, I'm sure I messed that up. But King Abijah is reminding um, the people of Israel that the covenant, the promise that God has given his people is a covenant of salt. And by that, he means it's everlasting. It's unbreakable. That's how strong salt was um, in, in the culture, in the lives of people at that time. And to be honest, I think it's just as strong today. I think we just kind of take it for granted because it's just everywhere. So how do we even get salt? I know that I get salt by going to the grocery store, but how does it get there? I've never wandered in the woods and, and seen salt on the ground. Sometimes I'll wander in the woods and see a plant. That makes sense to me. Can I grow salt in my backyard? Where does this even come from? Well, there are a couple of ways. We're going to look into it. 